Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Valley PBS. Today we are chatting with Jeremy Tobias, the CEO of the Community Action Partnership of Kern. Nicole Salea is Community Food System Director of Foodlink for Tulare County. And Tim Adam is Director of Program and Operations for the Merced Rescue Mission. They have generously agreed to share some of their experience with us. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for having us. So serving people in need, particularly when there is such a broad range of needs in this area, is always challenging. How do you take very scarce resources and invest them so that they really have impact on the daily lives of people? So Tim, starting with you, talk a little bit about the rescue mission uh, and, and the work that you do, the people that you serve. At the rescue mission, we have uh, three different programs going on right now. We have a nine month new life transformation program, which is a faith-based program for people that are trying to get off of drugs, alcohol, or just get out of homelessness. We also have sober living homes, which are for people who have finished a program or going to school, working, that still want that safe, sober, structured environment um, that aren't quite ready to take that step into getting their own place. And then we have a respite care home, which is for homeless people getting discharged from the hospital that have no other place to go. So we provide them with a short-term stay while we try and work with them and do case management to get them housing or get them reconnected with family, um, whatever we can do to help them stay off the street and stay out of the hospital. And there's so many different aspects of this, right? Mm -hmm. You have the fact that there is a mental health aspect to this. Yes. There's a physical health mm -hmm. uh, 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 piece to this. Of course, addiction being uh, the part that bridges both, but then there are also the practical realities of holding a job, mm -hmm. of finding a home, of having shelter. It's it's a very, very complex problem set. Yes, it is. Um, and that's why we provide a very intense case management with all of our clients and all of our programs where we create goals for them, whether it be finding a primary care physician, we provide peer navigation to get them to all of their appointments. We work in partnership with a lot of other agencies in Merced County to help with housing or to help with um, after we do assessments if they need to go to behavioral health or if we see the need for them to get a uh, disability, we'll connect them with a SOAR worker. So through our case management, we're able to really find out what are their exact needs at that time and we want to get them addressed as quickly as possible and provide all the navigation and accompaniment we can for them. And Nicole, in Tulare County, you're working primarily, your organization is working primarily with the food part of this, of this issue. So talk about the range of your services and your support. Right, so Foodlink uh, provides many different uh, programs throughout Tulare County. Uh, the main one, of course, being uh, providing emergency food assistance to about 30 different pantries. We work with, with about 30 different pantries throughout Tulare County where we provide them with USDA commodities. And then we also do free farmers markets where we go out, especially to the more rural areas that don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables as easily. So we'll do free farmers markets in those areas. Um, we also do a program where we send uh, packs of food home with uh, children, about four to 500 different kids throughout Tulare County. Every week we send them home with a pack of food um, on Fridays. Um, the, the schools help us identify food insecure children. And so those are the kids that rely on the free and reduced lunches and breakfasts at school. And so when they go home, they don't have access to the food that they need. So we make sure to send them with packs of food, kid-friendly food home that they can um, share with their families and that they can also uh, prepare very easily themselves. Uh, we also do a, ver a lot of nutrition education. Uh, we have a really beautiful teaching kitchen at our facility and we provide free um, community-based classes around nutrition, um, around cooking for health, and using food as medicine. And then we also do a lot of food systems work. Tulare County, it's ironic, Tulare County is one of the highest um, profit-producing counties in the state around agriculture. But we have a high, high food insecurity rate, about 40%. And so um, we also do a lot of uh, community organizing and um, helping to work with specific communities around uh, bringing food security to them and their, and their uh, neighborhoods, um, focusing on um, growing their own food or bringing, um, 
grocery stores into their small communities, anything to help them access the food that they need. It really does beg the question, if we are so productive, if our wealth is so based in agriculture and food, why do we have 40% food insecurity in, in this region? Need is so great, but, but there is also tremendous wealth that is produced by Kern County. Exactly. Uh, Kern County, uh, being one of the largest ag producing counties in the, in the nation, as are many of the counties in the valley, and also uh, one of the largest oil producing uh, counties in the nation. Energy is, and agriculture. And agriculture. Uh, it's a, seen as a fairly you know, wealthy county at the top. But we face many of the same problems the rest of the uh, counties in the valley do with very, very high poverty rates, very high unemployment rates, and an extremely high food insecurity rate. And uh, at Community Action Partnership of Kern, we promote self-sufficiency. And uh, one of our programs we do operate is a food bank. And we see the needs you know, on a daily basis in Kern County. What do you see as the, as the fundamental um, set of issues that need to be addressed? that could, could systematically uh, begin to shift the realities for, for so many people living in poverty? I think housing is one of the primary factors. Um, that leaves very little income for necessary items such as food and utilities and whatnot. Um, another problem is uh, the inability of the low-income workers to move up in the system. And uh, the working poor, they're, they're trying to make ends meet. Uh, they're out there working and hustling. These aren't uh, People are looking for free handouts. They're, they're out there working and they're hustling and they, they're making minimum wage and it's tough to make ends meet in an expensive state. And uh, you know, when most of your income goes towards housing, there's very little left for food and, and other essential supplies. And, and how do you see it, uh, Tim? You've got, you, you, on the one hand, you have housing. On the other hand, you have addiction, yeah. right? The, this, th this issue of, of housing um, is it related to uh, addiction, or are these just two separate bookends of, of the continuum of poverty that we have in this region? Well, I see housing being <clears throat> one of the big issues. In Merced County, we have a 1% vacancy rate. So, I mean, I can do my best to get housing choice vouchers for people or get them on disability, but there's still no place to put them into housing right now, plus with the prices of rentals going up, like Jeremy was saying, there's um, very little left over for utilities and food. Um, with addiction, uh, that is an issue and we address that by getting them set up with behavioral health and stuff, but our main thing is to get them into housing first. We go with the housing first model, so we try and do a very low barrier harm reduction type of housing. Let's get them in and then address the issues of substance abuse and provide case management to help them remain in that housing. But as far as Merced goes, housing is a very big issue. There's just not enough of it right now. Do you feel that there's a connection between addiction and self-medication to alleviate the stress that um, Jeremy was talking about of, of having low-wage jobs, struggling, 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 um, until the, a bump in the road is hit, you, you become injured or you have to take some sick time or your child or your family member needs some time and all of a sudden that tenuous existence becomes um, out of reach and then the stress just builds and builds and builds. You start off self-medicating, maybe you're drinking a little bit, maybe you're, you're, you're uh, taking a, a pill or smoking some weed and over time it takes over your life. Do you, do you feel that those two areas are, are connected? I, I can see that happening. I know from personal experience, um, I was in a low paying job when I first moved back to Merced from Sacramento. Uh, things weren't going well and the stress was getting to me. I started drinking too much and I ended up losing the job, losing my place and was homeless for about two and a half, almost three years. Um, until I went to the Merced Rescue Mission. I'm actually a graduate from the mission and got hired on. Thank you. Um, but it is possible to get past the hurdle of addiction and substance abuse um, if you're willing to seek out the help. Um, that's the main thing. Some people, they want the housing, but they don't want to seek the help for other underlying issues in their life. 
And Nicole, in terms of the the uh, the work that you do, you were uh, mentioning that you provide a whole range of different services beyond food. Could you describe some of those services? A lot of what we do is, like I said, community organizing where we're working in um, specific communities, talking to the leaders in the communities and finding out what they need, um, meeting these people where they are. And it's always, it, there's always a connection with housing, with addiction, um, it's, it's, everything is so intertwined with environment, with health, that, um, you know, we, we do a lot, too, of, of talking about food as medicine because um, when it comes to access to healthy, healthy food, uh, that, that, that's usually the first thing to go when people are having to pay rent or people are having to buy medications. And so um, all of it just becomes a, a huge snowball, and so we see that... Um, that meeting these people where they are and going to the communities and finding out where we can help, not just with emergency food, but also with access to, um, to health care and education and that kind of thing. Like We make sure to, to think systemically when it comes to food systems and food insecurity. And so it's very important to us to take more of a grassroots kind of community organizing standpoint. Let's talk a little bit about the term community organizing. I, I always find this to be fascinating because it seems to have become politicized since uh, President Obama um, had, uh, had mentioned that he had a community organizing background. What is community organizing in this sense? One of the, the main ideas that I always think about is with us, by us, for us. I'm a, I'm a longtime resident of Tulare County. With us? With us, by, by us, us, for us. For us. Um, we never go into a community and say, here's what you need. We always ask. We always develop relationships. So the us is, is we the people. Mm -hmm. We the people of the United States of America. Right. And so, you know, being a resident, a longtime resident of Tulare County and growing up um, a little bit poor and knowing what food insecurity is, I know that we cannot just go into communities and dictate the circumstances or dictate the need. They, they have to tell us and they have to trust us. So it's, it's time consuming. It takes time to develop those relationships with community leaders. So when you're saying they have to trust us, you're not saying you have to trust us. You're saying we have to earn your trust. Exactly. By listening. Exactly. So we the people are going to come together and talk about our problems mm -hmm. and the solutions. Correct. And you're listening. Correct. It, it is. It's about listening and it's about meeting people where they are and um, not vilifying people, not judging people, but always um, looking at circumstances and systems as a whole. Jeremy, how does Community Action Partnership gather that intelligence from the communities that you serve? Well, it's all about engagement. So, uh, and, uh, you know, meeting people at their point of need is important. Going out into the community and showing them, you know, showing up, being there for them, not just, uh, you know, sending out flyers and things like that, but being there in person. Uh, we operate a couple of community centers and we routinely have community organizing events at those centers. Um, it's about engaging with the public. Uh, we have a wonderful yet complex system in the United States. It, it can be very rewarding and, and people can become very successful, but there's just, you know, it's not perfect. And I don't think it's supposed to be perfect. And there's people that fall through the cracks. And being able to engage with those people and finding out what it is they need so they can find their piece of the American dream is what's really important in, in listening to them. So when you interact with people and you are collecting intelligence and you are employing them, where do you employ them from? Who are the people who work for your organizations? We're a rather large nonprofit. We have about 860 paid employees, but we have hundreds and hundreds of volunteers as well. And I'll use my food bank as an example. Our food bank distributes well over a million pounds a year uh, of food in Kern County. And we do that with about you know, 15 staff, uh, but hundreds of volunteers. And, uh, and they're from throughout the community. Uh, it can be large organizations that come in and volunteer, individuals that want to volunteer. But volunteerism is still alive and well in the United States, and it's a very, very important part of what we do. So your organization is also shaped and staffed uh, and helped by we the people. That's correct. I mean, y y Americans are extremely generous people and, and giving people. And uh, you see that every day in the programs we all operate. Um, there's always people asking, how can I help? And, uh, and I think that's important for the people we're helping as well, seeing that their fellow citizens are helping them. Uh, it's not just some paid bureaucrat that's there to you know, 
help them out, but it's, it's their fellow citizens. And we oftentimes see those clients, once they're engaged back in that successful system, they come right back and they volunteer at our food bank. And they, they're helping, they're, they're giving They're helping, back. that's right. And, and the food that you, th that you bring in from your food, for your food bank, uh, Jeremy, or for you, for you, Nicole, where does that food come from? We procure food from, um, both from donations and we purchase quite a bit, especially our fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, we, we do have to buy most of that. Um, but the food that we distribute to our pantries comes from the USDA program. And so that, um, that is provided through the state. And, um, but then we also do a lot of purchasing, as I said, through, through various different avenues. Um, we will, of course, accept donations from, um, from packing houses, from farmers, from agriculture producers. So um, we procure it from as many different places as we can. In terms of the price that you pay for your fresh fruits and vegetables, um, are they competitive um, market prices? Are they particularly uh, set in, in certain ways that, that uh, take into account the needs of the, of the region? For the most part, uh, they, are, they fluctuate depending on the market. Um, we are able to make our dollars go farther. We can usually buy at wholesale um, or at a very reduced price. Uh, we, we buy a lot through California Association of Food Banks, and so they're able to, uh, to get the price down for us. So our, any donated dollar goes very far for us. And how do you create your, your, um, your housing and your, and your uh, various physical assets that are required, uh, Tim, to support your constituents? Uh, pretty much everything we get is based off of donations. Whenever we get a new sober living house, we reach out to the community and let them know we need beds or dishes or whatever. And, you know, people are very generous with donations. We sometimes get more than we can use in all of our houses. A lot of our food is from donations from uh, local restaurants, um, Panda Express, Little Caesars, Pizza Hut, they all provide us community, with... Community leaders, people yeah. who have franchises, people mm -hmm. who are operating those businesses. So we're able to take that food, hand it out to the homeless people in parks or the really low income neighborhoods we know of, we'll take that food out there. So 90% of what we get is donations. We don't purchase a lot. When we do have to purchase food and stuff, we go to our local food bank in Merced. The thing that's also interesting to me is that nobody's waiting. None of you are waiting for somebody else to solve the problems. And, and indeed, the people who are, um, who are uh, working with you, they're not waiting either. They are basically taking the power. They sometimes need guidance. They sometimes need help. They sometimes need organizing. Sometimes other competencies are required to deliver the, the particular service or product or food at a particular place at a particular time when people show up. But that's partly what a team is about. It's about helping each other to, to develop um, a solution. And, and that solution is actually coming from the community, from the community that, that you are helping to community organize. How many people do you serve on an annual basis, Tim? In last year, we served probably around 1,000 people. Um, but that's not including our uh, like community stewardship, like picking up the food from other organizations and spreading that out into the community. We also do a Thanksgiving and a Christmas Eve dinner for the homeless, which will serve about a thousand people at each. Um, so it's really hard to say exactly how many people we've reached out to. Um, I do know that through just our respite care program, about 60 to 80 percent of those we are able to get into some kind of housing. So that is a pretty big chunk of the high utilizers, the tri-morbid people that have been on the streets, being able to get them into housing, lower their hospital stays, which um, saves the county money also. And Nicole, how many people do you serve? I know that uh, last year we served over 350,000 individuals and families, um, both through our emergency food distributions and also through our nutrition education. Jeremy? Well, we, we keep track of two numbers. Duplicated, which means how many lives we touch, you know, uh, it's upwards of 500,000 uh, people served. But unduplicated, we're talking about 70,000 a year. How would this community as a whole be affected if you didn't exist? I think the goal of a lot of community organizations is get to the point to where we're not needed. Um, that's our goal. If we're able to 
solve or greatly diminish the homeless uh, problem in our area, then I'm not needed anymore. The rescue mission isn't needed anymore. Um, I think that all community organizations need to work together to help get to that um, point. And there's a lot of money coming in from the states and from different HUD funding that can help with that. It's all having a community vote on the best way to spend that money and the best way for your community and your county to get that done. In a sense, isn't your work part of making the more perfect union more perfect? Right? If we can take the people who fall between the cracks and help to elevate them into self-sufficiency, isn't that part of, of what that system that you were referring to, Jeremy, uh, requires? It's part of the lubrication to actually allow that system to function for everyone and not just for the few. That's correct. Uh, in my mind, uh, without our agencies and, 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 and community members stepping up and, and, and providing services such as this, the system really would fall apart. Um, this beautiful and perfect system we have, part of it is this compact we all have of, of those of us that are successful and self-sufficient is making sure as many people as possible can reach that, you know, dream, the American dream. And, you know, there's always going to be this imperfect balance where there's people falling through that crack and being able to boost them back up. They have to take care of themselves some way and their families. And they're certainly not going to let their family starve to death. And I don't think any of us would. And so if there's not a system in place to help catch these people and provide any safety net programs and boost them back up and into the, into the successful system, I think the system falls apart. And, and, isn't that and you can imagine where it might go. I mean, are, you, are people going to let their families starve to death? I wouldn't, I wouldn't let my family starve to death. And you're going to do whatever you have to do. And I think we all owe it, you know, as part of this successful society to make sure that when people do slip through that crack for whatever reason, that we offer a helping hand and get them back engaged in that system. And that's part of our responsibility as Americans, Nicole. Correct, yes. Um, the, we think of ourselves as filling, filling the gap that the, the safety net doesn't provide. And, um, you know, it is, it is unfortunate that our tax dollars aren't providing um, the, the base of what people need, the just basic housing, food, clean water, and clean air. Um, I would much rather my tax dollars go to spending um, spending that money on my neighbor's health and well-being. And so with FoodLink, you know, we see that the gap is just keeps getting wider and wider, and so our resources keep getting stretched farther and farther. And so if our social safety net is falling apart, it just puts so much more pressure on us. And it, it seems like a never-ending cycle at times, but when we're looking at things systemically, we want to see people, of course, being self-sufficient, but we also don't want there to be cracks in the first place in the, in the, in the system. Falling through the cracks just shouldn't happen in a, in a country like ours with such wealth and such resources. Um, we want our people to, to, be, um, to be autonomous and to be strong and to be healthy um, in every sense of the word, and so looking at systemic change is, is difficult, but it is necessary, I feel. So we are forming a more perfect union by taking care of those who fall through the cracks, and we are forming a more perfect union by discussing systemic solutions to those problems so that fewer and fewer people fall through the cracks so that we, as service providers, are less necessary. I'd like to thank you all for, for sharing the experience of the Community Action Partnership of Kern, Jeremy Tobias, uh, Foodling for Tulare County, Nicole Celaya, and Merced Rescue Mission, Tim Adam. Thank you so much for your support of the community, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.